And I also saw the trailer for the new Matt Damon film before oh, this called yeah. The Great Wall. Yeah. From visionary director you've never heard of. It's a Chinese film. While it wasn't his best film by far, The Great Wall from 2016 really was directed by a visionary filmmaker. And if you've never heard of him, let me introduce you to the one and only Zhang Yimou, China's greatest director. Born to a doctor mother and dermatologist father in 1950, Zhang Yimou's early life was marked by his family's past involvement with the nationalist movement. During the Cultural Revolution, Zhang left school and did manual labor for 10 years. During this time, he developed an interest in visual arts and sold his own blood to a blood bank to buy his first camera. After the Cultural Revolution, Zhang applied to the Beijing Film Academy, but at 28, he was over the school's admission age limit. He appealed to the faculty, and eventually his photography portfolio made its way to the Minister of Culture, Huang Zhen. Impressed with Zhang's talent, the minister himself instructed the academy to admit him. Zhang finally graduated in 1982, as part of the class that formed China's so-called fifth generation of filmmakers. This talented group would go on to spark a renaissance in Chinese cinema. According to Zhang, they were greatly influenced by 1949's The Spring of a Small Town, recognizing the brilliance of the movie and lamenting that Chinese cinema declined so drastically in the years since it was made. How is it possible that China made such a film in 1949, and yet 40 years later, we have such a leap backward? Now we're not even making bad films, but trash. We had lots of discussions about that and promised ourselves that when we graduated and started to make films, that we would never make films which go backwards. After graduation, Zhang was assigned to work as a cinematographer at the state-run Guangxi Film Studio, over 2,300 kilometers from Beijing. He was the director of photography on One in Eight and Yellow Earth, both successful directorial debuts of his classmates Zhang Junzhao and Chen Kaiga, respectively. He then worked on Wu Tianming's Old Well, where he also stepped in front of the camera as the lead actor. He even won an award for his performance at the Tokyo International Film Festival. In 1988, Zhang Yimou moved on to directing and immediately knocked it out of the park with his debut, Red Sorghum. Based on a novel of the same name, the film tells the story of Zhu Wei, a young woman who was married off to the owner of a wine distillery. When he dies shortly after, Zhu Wei inherits the distillery, which had fallen on hard times during his ownership. But with hard work and determination, Zhu Wei inspires the workers and rescues the business. Jouer also has a lover, a man who once saved her from bandits when she was traveling to her wedding. As the distillery finally finds success, the Sino-Japanese War breaks out and Japanese Imperial troops invade the area. When they torture and kill a distillery worker, Jouer wants revenge and plans an ambush on the Japanese soldiers. The film was received warmly abroad and garnered positive reviews from international critics. Its successful festival run culminated in the Golden Bear Award at the 1988 Berlin Film Festival, a first for China. Red Sorghum also marked the debut of Gong Li, China's preeminent actress, who started a relationship with Zhang on set and starred in several of his later movies with great success. A year later, Zhang's sophomore film Codename Cougar was an airplane hijacking thriller. It was poorly received, and Zhang later dismissed it as his worst film. He co-directed Codename Cougar with his best friend Yang Fengliang, and perhaps this shared credit allows it to be sidelined as a footnote in his career rather than a blemish. In any case, Zhang more than made up for this failure with Zhu Dao, his third movie from 1990. He managed to secure financing from a Japanese company, which allowed him to use better equipment. For the first time, he didn't shoot on expired film stock, and he fulfilled his dream of using a Panavision camera. The film once again stars Gong Li as a young woman married off to an older man. She plays the titular Judo, who is trapped in a marriage to the tyrannical owner of a silk dyeing factory. He's abusive and violent, keeping her on a tight leash and turning her life into a living hell. She gradually finds solace in the hands of her husband's nephew, who also works at the factory, and they become lovers. 
Trouble arises when she becomes pregnant, and the boy later questions his paternity. According to Zhang himself, the film might be difficult to understand for a Western viewer because of cultural differences. I don't think a Westerner can understand why we can stand all this oppression for our whole lives. For them, it is simply inhuman. Actually, I don't care too much whether this concept can reach American audiences because one has to recognize the uniqueness of each culture. Nonetheless, the film garnered even more international acclaim than Red Sorghum. It became the first Chinese film to be nominated for an Academy Award for Best Foreign Language Film. However, this landmark success was tainted with controversy at home. The officials who entered the film into competition were disciplined, and the Chinese government attempted to withdraw Zhu Do from the Oscars. The film was banned in China and only released to theaters two years later. Hardliners in Deng Xiaoping's government felt that the film's negative portrayal of the old man, the young couple's revolt against him, and its bleak portrayal of peasant life went against the state's interests. This would not be the last time Zhang Yimou faced censorship. 1991 saw the release of Raise the Red Lantern. Set in the 1920s, Gong Li yet again plays a young woman married off to an older man. This time, she plays Song Lian, an educated 19-year-old whose father recently died, leaving the family bankrupt. She becomes the fourth wife of Master Chen, the wealthy owner of the palatial compound where the entire movie is set. She quickly discovers that Chen's household is run by a strict hierarchy based on which of the four wives is currently in Chen's favor. Once he chooses which wife he will spend the night with, red lanterns are lit in her chambers, and she receives privileges such as attention from the servants, the choice of what food will be served, or a foot massage from Chen himself. Naturally, this arrangement creates competition between the wives and Bru's animosities. Song Lian is forced to play the game and she also finds an enemy in her maid, Yanner, who is in love with Chen and wishes to step up from servant to mistress. The film received universal international acclaim, and apart from several wins at festivals and a BAFTA award, it also marked China's second Oscar nomination in a row. Raise the Red Lantern was praised for its emotionally charged drama, Gong Li's superb performance, and especially for its cinematography. It's filled with breathtaking visuals, with every scene worthy of a screenshot. The film apparently boosted tourism in China after the 1989 Tiananmen Square massacre due to its use of the Chao family compound, an exotic historic location. Zhang Yimou's incredible run in the 90s continued with the story of Chiu Zhu in 1992. Here, Gong Li plays a pregnant peasant woman who seeks justice for her husband after he was beaten by a village official. The stubborn protagonist's pursuit of simple moral justice questions whether an ordinary person can get the government to admit wrongdoing. But the film also has a dry comedic undertone, as her chief grievance is that her husband was kicked in the groin, and she comes across as a country bumpkin once she travels to the big city. It's not quite as lofty a film, and certainly much less visually impressive than Jang's previous output. But it was still another international festival hit, winning the Golden Lion at the Venice Film Festival. It was also selected as the Chinese entry for the 65th Academy Awards. But a hat trick was not meant to be, as it was not nominated. Zhang would have to settle for two Oscar nominations for his movies, at least for now. The film is set in the present day, that is in 1992 and Zhang Yimou filmed many of its street scenes with a hidden camera, capturing authentic images of early 90s life in China. Zhang's streak culminated with 1994's To Live, a sweeping family epic based on the novel by Yu Hua. It covers four generations of the Shu family, spanning 40 years of China's tumultuous history. It begins with the Chinese Civil War in the 1940s, moves on to the many tragedies and absurdities of Mao's Great Leap Forward, covers the Cultural Revolution, and ends with the glimmers of hope in the 1980s. Its primary focus is on Shu Fugi and his wife Jia Zin, who are caught in a whirlwind of historical events that affect their lives. Although it highlights the resilience of ordinary Chinese people, the film is not a propaganda piece. 
it is predominantly critical, depicting many hardships and injustices of life in China and the negative effects of its policies. For this reason, the film was denied a theatrical release. To Live also came out shortly after Farewell My Concubine, which was that year's Oscar nominee, and The Blue Kite, two great works that also portrayed China's policies in a negative light. Many critics believe the film deserves an Oscar. Zhang believes it all comes down to politics. But he says he can't understand why he had so much trouble with the Chinese government. Zhang maintains that his films are artistic and not meant to be political, but he can't convince the authorities. Despite its official ban, however, the film was shown in some Chinese theaters and was widely available on video. Though banned at home, To Live received universal critical acclaim abroad. The film won the grand prize at the Cannes Film Festival, and its star Zhao Yu became the first Asian actor to win the Cannes Best Actor Award for his lead role. He was previously known for comedies and was unsure of his ability to express deep emotion. Perhaps this elevated his performance to a level of relatable realism. Red Sorghum, Ju Du, Raise the Red Lantern, The Story of Chu Ju, and To Live all feature strong lead characters. They are ordinary people who find themselves in difficult situations outside of their control, often related to their lower social status. Their lives are affected by social norms and government policies, and Zhang Yimou never shied away from depicting the hardships of life in China, whether in the past or the present. He did not praise the country, but he highlighted its people as determined and resilient. Shanghai, the economic hub of China before the Communist Revolution, welcomed the freewheeling capitalism of the new China like an old friend. Zhang Yimou was inspired by the city's economic revival to make Shanghai Triad, a 30s gangland story of the city in its pre-revolution heyday. Starring China's most prominent film actress Gong Li, the film is a change of direction for Zhang. He's previously been able to attract international investors in the wake of international acclaim for his films. But not this time. Beijing has banned foreign involvement in Shanghai Triad. Financial woes aside, 1995's Shanghai Triad was somewhat of a departure from Zhang's usual themes too. Its English title suggests a mobster crime film, but a lot of Shanghai Triad is a coming-of-age story and a tragedy. It mostly features the crime lord's mistress, a nightclub singer with a mean streak, and her new wide-eyed servant. It's a solid movie elevated by its strong ending, but one could get away with calling it Lesser Zhang. However, it was nominated for an Academy Award for its cinematography and a Golden Globe for Best Foreign Language Film, so even Zhang's mid-movies were still very successful. Shanghai Triad is also his seventh film with Gong Li, but the last one for many years to come, as their romantic relationship ended during production. A further departure was Zhang's late 90s dalliance into neo-realist, documentary-style filmmaking which he employed for his next three films, Keep Cool, Not One Less, and The Road Home. Keep Cool from 1997 saw Zhang abandon the polished visuals which won him critical acclaim. It features jagged editing, stark colors, and dynamic camera work, all in service of capturing the hustle and bustle of contemporary Beijing. The film was pulled from its world premiere at Cannes by Chinese censors as part of a crackdown on films, and Zhang was asked to make several changes, including adding a happy ending. Not one less returned Zhang to the countryside to portray the struggles of ordinary peasant people, this time played by actual ordinary peasant people, as Zhang opted to cast non-actors. It's a charming tragicomedy about a 13-year-old substitute teacher in a rural school. One of the kids drops out to go earn money for his family, but he goes missing in the big city. The other pupils and the young teacher band together and try to get him back using child naivety, ingenuity, and perseverance. The film addressed education reform in China and highlighted the gap between urban and rural populations. However, the film attracted some negative reaction from foreign critics who disagreed on whether the film was praising the Chinese government or not. It's unclear how one could think the movie is praising China when it's showing poverty and child labor. 
But in any case, this controversy led Zhang to pull the movie from the Cannes competition. Not one less, nonetheless enjoyed success and won the Golden Lion at the Venice Festival. The Road Home is Zhang's first straight romance, a tale about a country girl and a young teacher falling in love. It was well received and won several domestic and international awards. It also marks the debut of actress Zhang Ziye, who would work with Zhang in future projects. And thus ended the 90s, an immensely successful decade for Zhang Yimou. His films racked up Oscar and Golden Globe nominations, BAFTA awards, wins at Venice, Cannes, Berlin, as well as domestic awards shows. Not to mention he launched the careers of two successful actresses and provoked the Chinese government. The following decade and beyond would see more successes and awards. The return of Gong Li and peasant perseverance, new genres, Hollywood collabs, but also a gradual decline into making merely solid movies. But we'll leave all of that for part two. Thank you for watching, and if you liked the video, please hit subscribe.